All right. So let's have a brief prayer for Romans here. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the gift of your word. We thank and praise you that you um, caused it to be written by your Holy Spirit. And as we continue to walk with you in the book of Romans, um, open our minds and our hearts and our lives to all that you have for us. We um, lift this up in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty. We are going to be singing number 516, Wake, Awake, for Night is Flying. It comes out of the end time section of the hymnal. So, 516, yes. And, uh, of course, like most Christians, we think we're living in them now. We might be right. We might not. Who knows, right? <laughs> um, what we do know is Jesus is our Lord and Savior, and he's got us. That's the main thing, right?
look forward to that day? Do we not? Do we not? All right. We are in Romans chapter 5, and it, the handout is page 19. I've got a couple here if anybody needs one. Okay, so let me find. All right, I know it's here someplace. Page 19, there we go. Okay, and we're actually down there. All right, anybody else? So we start chapter five. Um, verses one and two, that's very pleasant um, in some respects. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into the grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And I was like, boy, that's great. And then we get to verse three. <laughs> and three through five says, not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings. Whoops. Wait a minute. How did that get in there? Right? Don't tell any of the TV preachers about this one. All right. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character and character, hope and hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom he has given us. So in this section here, Paul takes a clear turn, right? He takes a clear turn into worldly difficulties. One of the marvelous, amazing things about the scriptures is they give us a realistic picture, don't they? We see not only the love and glory and power of God, but we also see the brokenness of the world we live in. And the brokenness that infects our lives, right? We see it. Here it is, you know? Um, and ultimately what he does is he says, you know, we're going to have difficulties living in this sinful world. And not only that, but we're going to have opposition because we follow Jesus. And we, we begin to see in many places in the world right now, more and more of that going on, okay? Um, we begin to see more open examples of it in the United States of America, right? How can you possibly believe that? You know, if you believe that, you must hate everybody. Yeah, you know, all this kind of stuff that's going on out right? Um, and in some respects, it's like, wow. Now, here's a curious connection. In verse two, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. In verse three, we also rejoice in our sufferings. The word rejoice is the exact same word in two and three. So we find joy in all the good gifts God has given us. And we're invited to find that same joy in our sufferings. And it's like, huh, how do we wrestle through that one? Jesus showed us how. Well, Jesus did. And, and recognize the theology of the cross versus theology of glory. Have you ever heard those terms? Okay, so let me paint a picture. Theology of glory says, God loves me. He is with me. He has given me this wonderful life. And all of my difficulties are just going to be taken care of by him. Because he is that glorious, all-powerful God. Got the picture? The theology of the cross right? 
comes at this a very different way. The theology of the cross says we see God most clearly in the suffering and death and then resurrection of his son. But we can't, we kind of like to go, let's get to the resurrection and let's skip that other stuff in the middle, right? The theology of the cross says, no, no, no. We need to clearly see Jesus suffering and death. And recognize when we get to Romans 6, one of the things that the scriptures talk about when it says that we are baptized into Christ in Romans chapter 6, right? One of the things it's going to say is we are baptized into his death so that we also might have new life with him. That in effect, um, what's happening is God himself pulls us into the suffering of Christ in order to bring about that new life. Now, that, that's a tough one, right? At the same time, it's very comforting. My God is not a foreigner to my suffering. You know, in the theology of glory, at its worst, it, I mean, at its worst, it says you're suffering because your faith isn't strong. What kind of message is that? What does that do to people? Right? It's very common, big burden. The theology of the cross says we suffer because Christ suffered first and told us we are going to experience that in this world and told us that he is not only with us, but he has gone before us and has suffered more profoundly and more deeply than we ever will, and is right there in the middle of it with us, right? We see that. And there's comfort there, at least for me. You know, when I'm dealing with all sorts of different things, right? And all of us have these things, right? All of us have these things. You know, I think about, you know, my mother's in her 80s. There's some things that have to happen there. I'm kind of wrestling with, well, you know, she's way far away from me. What can I do there, right? I've got a brother who's, well, he's living in a house that needs a little cleaning. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just put it that, and I'm trying to figure out what do I do with that, right? I love him. He's a full-grown adult. He's not my responsibility in that sense, but I still love him. What is my Christian duty there? What does that mean, right? <laughs> and, and that's just a little bit of the kind of stuff that, you know, I'm carrying right now. You got yours too, right? Now I think we all, yeah, we do. All of us and do. we wrestle, like how you describe your situation, we wrestle with it. W what do I do and what I need to know is this is not a foreign idea to my Lord and Savior, that he's fully aware of those situations in ways I cannot possibly be, that he's working on my heart and my conscience to say, I've got a role for you. And if it's not clear, just keep praying about it and stay with me and it will become clear, right? And that ultimately, when I call you into that, I've given you the strength to deal. Okay, and the reality is, is a lot of those kind of things that level. I mean, it's one thing to have. I've got some physical problems that I'm suffering through. All right, that that definitely is very real. It's very difficult, especially if it's a day in day out kind of a thing. But when we're suffering for somebody we love, at least to me, that seems to be a heavier weight. Right that we're asked to carry. We are never asked to carry it alone. And the reality is, is how can I find joy in that stuff? Now I can find joy in knowing that both my brother and my mother know Jesus as Lord and Savior. So no matter what happens in their life, they're gonna be okay, right? The messiness that's going on now, right? 
you know? And sometimes there's joy mixed with that concern, right? So this last weekend was with my family, that my three kids and the two wives and the two grandkids, all right? As well as some other relatives in that part of the world. Um, so my youngest and his wife revealed to us they're expecting in March. A wonderful, joyful experience. Aubrey, my son's wife, has a congenital heart defect. So, and I mean, it's well under treatment. I mean, she's a pharmacist. She's a very brilliant lady. She really is. Um, the reality is this, that, you know, if you have a day where you've worked hard all day and you're tired at the end of the day, that's for normal. And at 12 weeks pregnant, the baby is just really sapping her energy. Yeah. So, you know, great joy. Also concern, <laughs> right? Lord, strengthen her, be with her, keep her safe. Because we know she's got this health condition, this right? Is this is the first one for Carl and Aubrey, for yes. Us, sorry. <laughs> yes, my, that, this will be our third grandchild. Okay. My first baby for them, Aww. yes. So, you know, and it's one of those things where my son is going to have to carry a little more of that load. Mm -hmm. Now, he is a phenomenal nurturing man, you know, at his best days, you know, and like anybody else, he has not so best days. <laughs> all right. Um, so praying for all of that, but you understand there's joy there. And even concern about the situation is, Lord, there can be joy and you can use this to help them more deeply connect with you. Because guess what? If it's something I can't do anything about, the only place I can go, well, there's two places I can go, despair and hopelessness, or to my safety. Right? No middle ground. And that's the way it is with a lot of us, right? That is exactly the way it is with a lot, and that's the theology of the cross. And I think that's one of the keys here to beginning to unlock this idea. Um, when it talks about that suffering, peace with God does not necessarily mean peace with the world. This is another aspect of it, right? Actually, according to the scriptures, it means the world is going to persecute us. And this has been true ever since Jesus' time, right? Was it true before his time? I think so. Did God's people ever face persecution before Jesus' time? Oh, yes. Absolutely. The battle started when? Genesis 3. That's when the war started. When Satan was told, an offspring of Eve will bruise your head and you will bruise his heel, the war was joined in earnest. Now, the war was already going on. Satan was trying to overthrow God, which is just, you know, again, I've said before, I believe Satan is the most deceived creature in the entire universe because he thinks he can destroy his creator. Okay? Um, and so basically, as he is there to tempt Adam and Eve, he is at war with God. He's using them as pawns in his war. The minute it turns out that God is going to restore all things through a human being, he's not at war with human beings, too. And that's true for all of us. So it's not if we're in the war, it's we're in the war, what are we doing? Right. <laughs> so ultimately, as we as we look at this, you know, the persecution is not anything new. And if we have lived a good chunk of our lives without facing genuine persecution for being a Christian, and I realize there's subtle persecution as well, but without facing genuine persecution, we need to thank God for that. All right. And at the same time, recognize that here is an upside in persecution. 
Uh, I've mentioned before, I'm reading a little Voice of the Martyrs book as I have time. And one of the individuals who was sharing his story um, basically said to the, the man who's writing the book, the man who was interviewing him, well, really, we welcome persecution as a Christian church uh, in our nation. It's like, why? Because all of those who are here just because they think it's the thing to do fall away quickly. And those who know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and are dedicated to him stay. In other words, it's a refining, right? And what does scripture say? That, that, you know, some, you don't like to hear this, but the scriptures occasionally mention God will refine you like gold. Well, how do you refine gold? You get it really hot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, turn up the heat all the way so that the impurities can be scraped off. God at times will use suffering to purify us. And we don't much like that process, but there's a certain level of joy in there if we understand it, right? And, and so as we wrestle with this, now there's a progression here as well. This is kind of the top of page 20. Um, there's a progression here. It starts with hope. And again, this is biblical hope. This is hope built on the promises of God. Then it goes into suffering. And what suffering does is it creates perseverance. And perseverance, when it has completed its work, creates character. We end up back with hope. Except the hope is deeper, right? And then we're told this love, this unconditional love that God pours into our hearts, right? All of this flows from faith. All of this flows from a living trust relationship with Jesus Christ. So ultimately, actually under all of this is God's everlasting love right that's the foundation um nothing changes in our lives without that foundation of that love that god has given us in christ it's not knowledge that changes us we need knowledge it's not the spiritual power to act on that knowledge we need that that's important it's that relationship with God that underlies everything and that allows what we learn and the power the Spirit gives us to make a difference in our lives, to make changes, right? It starts with that loving relationship. So what we read here in this particular place is that hope in Christ often results in worldly suffering. Right? Not guaranteed. Often does that. As we experience suffering, that's what builds perseverance. Now, perseverance can be defined as steadfast endurance in the faith. Even though he slay me, yet I will praise him. That's Job, right? That's, that's a perseverance statement. I am sticking with this, even though everything my senses tell me is that God has abandoned me. Even though he hasn't. And that's perseverance. That's perseverance. In Job's case, God does, in fact, restore him, rebuild him, renew him with a much deeper faith, right? So that perseverance refines us. Um, 
we're in that living relationship with a living Savior. Now, on God's side, on Jesus' side, there is nothing in the way of the relationship. Does this make sense? But on my side, I have all sorts of things in the way. Because I'm a sinful human being. I live in a sinful world. All right? Um, I learn attitudes from infancy on. And some of those attitudes are godly, and some of them aren't, <laughs> all right? And the godly ones, Jesus, by his Holy Spirit, works through those. And the ungodly ones kind of get in the way. And suffering sometimes causes me to question some of those things that I've just always believed are true that really aren't, right? And the Holy Spirit then, through that love of Christ, begins to take those out of my life. Got it? How many of you uh, have ever hung around young children long enough to figure out that they are deeply ingrained with this idea that life should be fair? <laughs> How many of us as young children believe that life should be fair? <laughs> It was kind of the kid's mantra. <laughs> well, it's kind of part of the sinful human nature, right? It really is. Where in the scriptures does it say life should be fair? <laughs> I don't find it. I've read the book several times. I have not yet found that great. Okay. I find that God is just, but Boy, we got to be careful with that one because if God is just, he punishes sin, and I'm a sinner, so now I'm in trouble. <laughs> right? I find that God is loving, but it's a love that does what is best for me, regardless of what I think is best for me, what God thinks is best for me. Right? Some of those attitudes that I now hold and beliefs that I now hold have come through suffering where things like life should be fair, got sacrificed on that altar. Okay, got it? See how that works? That suffering and that perseverance, that sticking with God, reduces the stuff in my life that gets in the way of that relationship. Think about somebody like King David. One thing can be said about King David throughout his entire life, at least what we have recorded of him, right? He trusts God no matter what. Does David have issues? Mm -hmm. Big ones. <laughs> right? Does God reduce some of those issues and draw David closer to him in the scriptures? Yep. How does it happen? Suffering for the most part. Right? He's running for his life. Okay. From Saul for all those years. And, and, and God takes some stuff and, and shapes him and molds him to be the kind of king he needs to be. Um, and then, he, then other things that are deep in his character show up and he's running for his life again from his son. Right? Can you imagine? But God uses that. Right? So from perseverance, we have character. Now that word character really means tested value or integrity. Integrity is what I do and say matches with what I say I believe, right? Because sometimes we say we believe things, but then what we do says other, <laughs> otherwise, right? And integrity is that those things are unified. Now, none of us, at least in this life, are ever full, fully, you know, acting in integrity, right? Because sin gets in the way and we go sideways. One of the things we can see, though, and this is kind of a looking back thing, at least I can see it in my life, I can see ways now that I am living in integrity where earlier I wasn't because God has purified me, right? And I can thank God for that. I think some of the rejoicing in this is seeing that that hard work is there, right? From this kind of character, 
we trust in God, we arrive back at hope. We arrive back at the hope that God is absolutely trustworthy. He's given us eternal life in Jesus Christ that begins now and will be fully experienced when we see Jesus face to face. We trust his promise in that regard. And ultimately, as Christians face difficulty, suffering, imprisonment, even death, the Holy Spirit can provide that assurance that I am with you, even if you die, you live. And we get to that Philippians statement, right? To live is Christ, to die is gain. That ultimately, that's kind of where a lot of this leads. In that hope-filled relationship with God, we're filled with his sacrificial love, his agape that flows in us and through us. So ultimately, when Paul is talking here about this whole idea of peace and joy, he's saying we have peace and joy when we're fully experiencing the abundance of God's blessings and not only do we have peace on the inside, but our life on the outside is peaceful as well. But we also experience peace and joy on the inside when life on the outside is very messy. And we can rejoice in both of those things. It's kind of a very curious way of, of looking at this, right? Um, here's what Luther says. Um, he who has faith indeed has all the excellent things, and parenthetically, which are mentioned in the text, but in a hidden way. Through tribulation, that would be suffering, they are tried and purified to the highest degree. Whatever virtues tribulation finds in us, it develops more fully. Now listen to the contrast. If one is carnal, weak, blind, wicked, um, irascible, haughty, and so forth, tribulation will make him more carnal, blind, wicked, and irritable. Ooh, <laughs> that's kind of difficult to listen to, isn't it? On the other hand, if one is spiritual, strong, wise, pious, gentle, and humble, he will become more spiritual, powerful, wise, pious, gentle, and humble. As the psalmist says in Psalm 4.1, thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. Wow. Have we seen that true? Have we seen that to be true? You know, that when people are put under pressure, you see, here's what's really inside. And regardless of what, how that comes out, we always can turn back to the Lord Jesus Christ and say, you know, I don't like what I saw inside of me. You know, thank you for saving me. Thank you for forgiving me. Help me to grow different. Right? It's 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 a it's a powerful thing here. I it, it never ceases to amaze me how applicable God's word is to all of life. To all of life. And, and realistically, in one sense, is there an intellectually satisfying or emotionally satisfying explanation to suffering? And the answer to that would be no, there isn't. But is there a, a way of looking <laughs> at suffering that says, this has meaning, this has purpose, and God is in it all. And there I find my hope. Yes. Because the world's answer to suffering is, it's hopeless. There is no answer. Right? If the poor soul is suffering too much physically, give him a pill. Take him out. That's the world's answer. Right? That's the world's answer. We have a much different answer from that. When things happen to us that we don't want, right? Why do we always say, "Why does this happen to me?" Because that's 
the believer's question. <laughs> okay. My response to that is, why not me? Well, and and that is another way. That's that's another way of kind of looking at this and saying, wait a minute. I'm a sinful human being living in a sinful, broken world. God is still God. And, and we'll, um, I'm working on a piece. I didn't get that far uh, for today, which is, you know, it's, I'm, I'm kind of wrestling through it, but that will take a little deeper look at this whole thing and that dynamic, right? And at the end of the day, we need to see, you know, God is fully in charge of everything. And if we try and get him off the hook, we're doing him a disservice because the theology of the cross says Jesus has joined me in my suffering and carries me through it. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, <coughs> and you will be with me. Ah, there it is, right? There's comfort there. There's not comfort in. Um, Oh, well, God must have a reason for all of this. I'm sorry, there's no comfort. There just isn't, right? Truth be told. Truth be told, the comfort is in Jesus is with me and he knows what's going on, even if I don't. That's why I never asked God the question of why. You can ask him who, what, when, where, and how, but never ask him why, because he's the only one who knows the last things. Well, and, and the reality is this, is that Job is not counted sinful for asking God why. Let's be clear. Yeah. Where his sin is, is insisting that God answer. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> because now Job is in effect putting himself in a higher position than God and says, you owe me an explanation. No, he doesn't. <laughs> right? And ultimately, when God shows up and asks Job question after question after question, none of which he can answer, right? Then he finally says, I repent in dust and ashes. This is too wonderful for me. I was asking about things I had no knowledge of. Right? That's why I didn't ask why. And, because he's doing that knowledge. <laughs> and, and recognize that that, you know, this is the thing, you know, when horrible things happen in life, the natural response on our part is no, I, this is not, no, right? And that is a believer's cry. Now recognize, and we don't talk about this a lot in church. That's why I'm kind of working on that other little piece is that God has given us a powerful way to deal with that. It's called lament. And lament starts with, my God, my God, why have you forsaken? That's where it starts. It starts with that feeling or that experience that I am all alone here, God. Where are you? Why aren't you keeping your promises? That's how lament starts. And you know what? About a third of the Psalms are lament. Isn't that interesting? Now, it doesn't end there. It ends expressing trust in our Lord and God. But it travels a road from God, where are you? To God, I trust you. There's a road that it travels. And if we learn to travel that road, guess what? Not only can we walk through suffering with a more peaceful heart connected to the Lord, but we also then are an incredible model to people around us. Because guess what? When people see us deal with suffering a different way than the world does, that gets noticed. It gets noticed. And we can, as God's people, walk through that. And I think part of it one of the things Paul is doing here is he's basically saying to his original readers and all the Christians the centuries, including us who've read this, and any Christian that ever will, or even non-Christians, and you know what? Suffering is not meaningless. It's not purposelessness. There is meaning and purpose here. And it's meaning and purpose that God has invested in. And the reality is, 
if one clings to Jesus, you grow in faith. If you rail at God and get ticked off at him because of the horrible life you're living, you go farther away from him. And we see that, we see that happen in both ways, right? So lots and lots of stuff there. Well, we're not gonna get to John 15. Um, so I, I think part of it, again, and we'll unpack this a little more fully, but at the heart of the theology of the cross is that we have a God who suffers for us. <clears throat> And because he has suffered for us, he also suffers with us. We are not alone. Because that's the other thing that suffering does. I'm the only one. That, that's a very, very natural human response. Nobody else knows the pain I have. Well, on this earth, that may be true. Because I don't know what's in your head. You don't know what's in mine, right? But we have a human being in the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth who is also God, who knows our suffering even more deeply than we do. And we are not alone. That's the comfort that's there is incredible, right? I don't have to explain God. I don't have to justify him. You know, why do all these horrible things happen? You know, you believe in a loving God. Why do all these horrible things happen? That's the ancient problem of evil. We'll talk about that. And ultimately, um, as we wrestle with that, like I said, there is no satisfying intellectual or emotional answer to that apart from a relationship with Jesus Christ. And there we don't find, there we don't find all the details, but what we find is a loving God who is with us. Powerful. Yes? So, I know, difficult to think through difficult to work through and especially if we're in the middle of something it's kind of like yeah okay God. <laughs> i hear you now come on come on <laughs> but and again we'll kind of talk through lament because lament is a language i think we have lost by and large in the church and we need to regain it especially in this day and age right um and it informs our prayers it does a lot of things so Anyway, that is stuff that is coming. Um, so, yep, we're at about. At least, at least in the West Coast now, um, people coming um, disrupting to something. Um, they just think that they're coming once, like abortion. Right. Like that. We're, we're seeing little, little places. God may be working. Yeah, I, I think God is deeply at work in our culture when you have this much chaos in a culture. Um, as long as we as God's people um, are willing to say, Lord, open my eyes to what you're doing, we're going to see his hand in it, right? Um, and nothing that's happening in our world and our culture is has escaped his notice. He knows exactly what's going on and where it's all leading. We don't know. And sometimes when we get disturbed as I do on where it's all going, got to go back to Jesus Christ is still Lord and is still working in all of this, not only for the good of his people and his kingdom, but for the glory of his name. And there will come a day when all of those who have deliberately set themselves up as enemies of God, knowingly or unknowingly, you know, he'll deal, he'll take care of that but I got to leave it in his hands, right? And that's something else we find in the Psalms. Uh, they're called imprecatory Psalms. That's just a big word that means, God, get them. <laughs> that's what it means. If you read those Psalms, that's basically what... Now, the psalmist is not going out there to get them. The psalmist is saying, God, get them, right? And there are things like, may the trap they have dug, may they fall into their own trap. You know, there are things like, you know, written against the Babylonians, blessed is he who dashes your babies against the rocks. Wow. 
That's Psalm 137, folks. That's in the Bible. Now, the Israelites are not running out and getting Babylonian babies. They're expressing their angst and their anguish and their outrage at the way their nation was destroyed. And if you read the prophets, he's got a couple things to say about Babylon, the way they carried out destroying the nation. And what matter of fact, he basically said, once I destroy Babylon, it will never be inherited or inhabited ever again. Do you know where Babylon is? Iraq. Current day Iraq. Do you know what's on the site of ancient Babylon? Ruins. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years later, ruins. Little known fact, Saddam Hussein was making plans to rebuild the city of Babylon as a tourist attraction before Gulf War II. Babylon is still ruins and he is no more. Who's worse than Islam? <laughs> you know, I, it's, it's like, thank you. <laughs> you know, who's where? And, and the reality is, when you look at building sites in that part of the country, it's a prime building site because you're right there on the river. Yeah, I mean, you got all this stuff that you would need to make light, and it's just, it's ruined. God's word will stand. Yes. And, and ultimately, you know, Satan tries to do everything he can to prove it won't, and he fails every time. So that's good news, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> Shall we pray? Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, good to be with you and- um, Happy meeting. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you so much again. Yes. You are welcome. Mm.